A horrific series of crimes grips Fort Wayne, Indiana. But when state-of-the-art technology joins the hunt, there's no escape for this predator. And then we travel to Colorado to meet a young mother and her two children who are staying in a hotel. As the mother readies herself for bed and the children are playing a board game, everything seems completely normal. Until the darkness swallowed them all. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. Hope you guys are having lots of fun. Hope you guys have some cool Halloween plans. I'm going to a Halloween party here in town. And that'll be fun, right? I hope I paid 20 bucks a ticket for it. But someone who's always fun is our newest Patreon supporter coming into Dead Rabbit Command right now. Give it up for Young Hemlock. Everyone give a round of applause for Young Hemlock. See if I can borrow $20 from him. Those tickets are expensive. Young Hemlock, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, I totally understand. Just help spread the word about the show, really. Young Hemlock, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys for the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We're going to leave behind Dead Rabbit Command. We are headed all the way out to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dead Rabbit Dirigible is taking us on a nice floaty journey out there. It's April 1st, 1988. We're in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So, like, people are, like, flying kites and laughing at all the pranks they're pulling. Oh, that's so funny. (laughs) As this guy's, like, smoldering. Oh, you fell for the whole fork in the socket prank. It's April Fool's. Everyone loves pulling April Fool's pranks. It's 3 p.m. And you got a bunch of little kids playing out in the yard. They're just like, I don't know, throwing mud at each other and doing what kids do. That's the only thing I know. Skip rope, marbles, throwing mud. And one of these is a young girl named April Marie Tinsley. She's eight years old. And she's out playing with her friends. And she goes, hey, guys, I have to run and go get my umbrella. So I'll see you guys in a second. She leaves her group of friends to go back home to get her umbrella. By the time that dinner rolls around, the family realizes that April is missing. So they contact the police and the police begin investigating this. And you know, in the beginning, you think it's just an April Fool's joke, right? Your kid, she's she's goofing off, she's hiding somewhere. You know there there had to have been that, the panic setting in, but the hope. It's all just a prank. It's not funny, April. It's not funny to play this joke. Come out. Where are you? Come out. The police have this massive search. They're looking for this eight-year-old girl. And during the search, they talk to someone and they say, I saw a white man in his 30s putting April into his pickup truck. So at this point, they absolutely know she's been abducted. They don't think that she's just hiding on April Fool's Day because she thought it'd be funny. They're they're now looking for a kidnapping. Three days later, in Spencerville, Indiana, April's body is found. Next to her body, they find one of her shoes, and they find a shopping bag that had a sex toy in it. Two years pass, and the police are no closer to finding out who killed April Tinsley. In St. Joseph Township, Indiana, on May 21st, 1990, people wake up to see a strange inscription on the side of a barn. Written with a crayon... Cray- you know what I mean? I can never pronounce that word right. You know the crowns, the cray, the crayons, like Crayola? Written on the side of a barn with a Crayola writing device, it said, I kill April M. Tinsley. Did you find the other shoe? Ha ha. I will kill again. Fourteen years later, Memorial Day weekend, 2004. In the city where it all started, Fort Wayne, Indiana, four notes are found scattered around town. One in a mailbox. The other three letters were left 
on the bicycles of little girls. When you opened this letter, you found the Polaroid of a man's lower body. It doesn't specifically say he's naked, <clears throat> but I'm assuming that. I don't think he was wearing a tracksuit or something like that. It's a man's... This <laughs> is pictures of his calves. I'm assuming it was of his naked genitals. But anyways, the news report said it was a picture of a man's lower body and a note. Well, that's creepy already, right? That's disturbing. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. But then it comes with this note. Hi, honey. His grammar is really bad. <laughs> I'm going to say that. His grammar is really bad. That's not me. I didn't suddenly become a caveman while I'm reading this. Hi, honey. I've been watching you. I am the same person that rape and kill April Tinsley. You are my next victim. If you don't report this to police, and if I don't see this in the paper tomorrow or on the local news, I will blow up your house. Each of these envelopes contained the photograph of a man's lower body, the letter, and a used condom. July 15th, 2018. This saga spanned around 30 years. 2018, on July 15th, 2018, a man is arrested. A 59-year-old man is arrested. His name, John Miller. He was 29 when he was doing this stuff. And for 30 years, he was uncaught. For 30 years, he was able to... And what's it? there's a lot of ways you can break this down. And you have to think... Did he do, were these the ones that they were able to connect to him? Were these the notable ones? How did he go so long and just do the, you figure like a pervert is a pervert for life. So maybe they'll connect him to other sex crimes, but he's arrested now. He's been convicted. He's really only been hit with the April Tinsley murder, rape and mur murder of April Tinsley. So, so his sentence was an 80 year prison sentence. But I don't, I, I don't think this would have been the only stuff he did. Does that make sense? But then again, one of the most... You know, I read true crime stuff all the time. And, you know, like the young girl in Japan who was tortured for like 10 days. Uh, her name escapes me right now. Um, the, I think it was called the Hello Kitty murder. And they had something similar in the United States. These stuff that... These like torture porn, tr true crimes, and all this stuff. That stuff... I, don't, I unfortunately don't even remember the young women's names. It's the it's weird what sticks with you when you read a bunch of true crime. One of the creepiest true crime stories I've read in a long time... Just happened a couple of years ago. Or it just came to light a couple of years ago. In Oregon... The police were investigating two separate murders of two 12-year-old girls. It was two 12-year-old girls, that maybe about a year apart, or like just a, maybe eight months apart, in the same general region, were kidnapped, raped, and murdered. And the police were investigating this, and then finally, after... That happened like back in the 80s, and the same thing like this. Finally, after 20, 30 years, they finally are able to identify the suspect... It was two totally different guys, totally unrelated. It was two random dudes who just in the same year decided to kidnap, rape, and murder a 12-year-old girl. I mean, it looked like they they thought it was like a, a, a serial killer. It was two totally, I don't want to say normal because they're not, but they they went on to have families of their own. They lived the next 30 years with normal jobs and families of their own and children. And both of them, just a couple months apart, never knew each other. Both of them decided to go rape and murder a 12-year-old girl. That's, that creeps me out more than the Hello Kitty murder. It, it just, it just something about it really, really terrifies me. That just randomly two people in the same geographical region could, to, could do that. It seems so alien, right? Like, I can understand rival gang member blowing his brains out. I can understand, I can understand like a mafioso saying, hey, you need to go kill this guy. And you're like a hitman. I can understand stuff like that. I can even understand, this might give me in trouble with the jury someday, but I can understand somebody coming home and finding their significant other in bed with someone else, and they lose it, and they chop them up with an axe. I can understand all that type of stuff. I don't understand two random dudes in Oregon both deciding to rape and kill a 12-year-old girl, 
And what what caused that in the first place? I already have a hard time wrapping my head around. And then to just go on and live a normal life and go, well, it got that out of my system. It wasn't as cool as I thought it was going to be. I, I'm not going to do that anymore. And to get away with it for 30 years. That's terrifying to me. And that's what this guy did. On Wikipedia, occupation former Walmart employee which Walmart may just love that free press. Former Walmart employee, if you went to Walmart in Fort Wayne, Indiana, for over the past 30 years, you probably met this guy. He might have helped you pick out a movie. It's just, that's so creepy to me, the normality of it, where you do it and then you just go back into society. So maybe this was the only, hopefully, right? I'm not hoping that he did more, but you would think they would, because isn't that what killers do? He kept trying, like, he kept drawing attention to it, and he got a thrill. But anyway, so, I mean, we have that psychological component, and will they find him connected to other stuff? This story is still really coming out now. But the other reason I wanted to profile this is one of the ways they caught him. I didn't even know this was real. This sounds like something from Star Trek. One of the ways that they caught him was they have this new thing called Snapshot. And they take your DNA, and it can draw a picture of you. They take your DNA and it can give, they go, based on this DNA, he's going to have this kind of nose and this kind of eyes and this kind of mouth. And that was one of the ways they caught him. Now, I don't think it was, I don't think it was the only way. I'm sure the judge would be like, that's really cool technology. And nobody, we have to test that out. It just can't spit out pictures of random people. But yeah, that is one of the ways that he caught him. This new technology that they're using. To catch people. And see, that's what I don't understand. If you killed someone in the 80s, you're thinking, I didn't leave any hair behind. I had gloves. So you weren't even thinking about hair in 1988. You'd be like, I wore gloves. So I didn't leave any fingerprints. Sherlock, <laughs> Sherlock Holmes will never catch me. And then anything you left on that crime scene is now can put you away for life. Which is good. I'm not complaining about that. But you wouldn't have thought of that. We did that story a long time ago about that guy who robbed a bank and he had really bad dandruff. And he threw a scheme. This is a real story. This is not a fever dream of mine. I'll put the episode in the show notes. He took off his ski mask and he's like, goes, aha, the perfect robbery or burglary or whatever it was. And he takes the ski mask off and he throws it in the trash. And the police find it and it's full of dandruff. And they go... We can't, we don't have, the technology is not here today, ladies and gentlemen, but someday we'll be able to test the DNA of dandruff, and they did, like, decades later, and they arrested him. So, very, very interesting story. Technology, DNA, and just, so you have that, and then you just have the raw creepiness of it. For 30 years, this guy walked around the community. You probably, if you lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and you shopped in the Walmart there, you probably met him. Super gross. It's just another reason never to move to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Young Hemlock, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the Carpenter Copter. We are leaving behind Fort Wayne, Indiana. We are headed all the way out to Colorado. We don't have a specific location of this hotel we're going to head to. The author who sent this story into Phantoms and Monsters, which is a really good website that collects first-person encounters. We've covered them a lot on this show. They didn't want to give out the actual location of this place. But they actually gave us enough hints that you might be able to find it if you're local. Maybe. I don't know. It's still a pretty big general area. In the Rocky Mountains, in west-central Colorado, overlooking the Colorado River and an Amtrak railway station, there's a hotel. Well... It's had a long history. In 1879, it was a whorehouse. So that's that's a good way to start off your hotel. And then it became a speakeasy. And then later on, it became low-income housing. And after that, a hotel. And in the year 1983, a mother and her two sons are going to spend a couple nights at this hotel. The mother had recently left the children's father. And she was going to make it on her own in a new city, a new start, raising her boys. But since she's making this big move, she doesn't have an apartment yet. So they say, let's stay in this hotel. It's like $30 a night. It's really cheap. Even back then, that was pretty good prices. 
And she has these two sons. We'll call them Sam. He's the youngest one. He's six. And then you have Charlie, who's eight years old. This is their first night in the hotel. And Sam says, when he got out of the car, he sensed a darkness in the room. He said when we got out of the car, it was already night. So the hotel already looked a little ominous. My mom opens the hotel room door and I go to step inside. It feels oppressive. It's giving off this really weird energy and I didn't want to go in the room. And my mom and my older brother, they laugh at me, right? I should be over this. I'm six years old. I'm scared of the boogeyman. Come in the room, Sam. My mother implores. Ah, you know, of course, it's just my imagination, right? Later that night, Mom is getting ready for bed. She's standing in the bathroom. And from where Charlie and Sam are sitting, they're currently unpacking a board game to play, they can see into the bathroom. With the bathroom door open, they can see their mom, and they can actually see her reflection in the mirror. And Sam's looking over there, and he hears his mom washing her hands, and getting ready to wash her face. And the room is... dim. There's only one lamp on in the entire hotel room. Even the bathroom light is off. They can still see their mother in the bathroom. There's enough light from the lamp to illuminate certain corners of the room, but not enough light to feel safe in. And as they're unloading this board game, all of a sudden, Sam hears his brother say, Stop. Listen. And Sam stops unloading the pieces, and the room falls quiet except for a low growl. Sam and Charlie's eyes are drawn towards the bathroom. And they can see their mother is still washing her face in the barely lit bathroom. But she is now violently splashing water into her face. The faucet's running full blast. And she's just splashing water in her face over and over and over again. And the water is splashing against her skin and flying off in all directions. Suddenly she swings her head up and stares straight into the mirror. Her children are watching this in the reflection. They see her eyes go wide as a huge grin covers her face. Then she starts laughing. The mother is staring into the mirror and watching her kids over her shoulder. They feel her gaze on them. She's staring at them using the mirror. She's still laughing harder and harder, her eyes locked on them. And then the laughter becomes a growl. And then the laughter starts to morph back into a growl. The mother turns to face her children. And that's when Sam realizes his mother is gone. Not mentally gone. Not she's lost it. His mother has vanished. Stepping out of the darkness of the bathroom is a nine-foot-tall, naked, reptilian man. It stares at the children, growling. It's described, and I know this is a plot, I know this is a plot twist. I know you guys probably didn't expect that, but that is what they saw was this naked reptilian man. That by any definition sounds like any of the alien reptiles we've covered on this show, or just in lore, just as you guys have been researching on your own. A reptilian, they tend to be very tall, very muscular, and that's what they see. They see naked, scaly green skin, bright orange-yellow eyes staring at them. Red lips, sharp teeth, 
and black talons. He said specifically, he goes, they weren't nails. They were thick. They were talons. An interesting detail he's added to this, though, that I have not seen in all my years of reptilian research. At least that I can recall. This reptilian had long, black, curly hair. So I haven't, I, I have not, I cannot recall a time that we've come across a reptilian with a full head of hair. But long, black, curly hair. And this reptilian is stepping out of the darkness of the bathroom. And begins walking towards them. And it's talking to them. Sam said it, it in between a series of grunts and growls, they could make out what this reptilian was saying. I'm so hungry. And you both look very, very tasty. It's walking towards them. Razor sharp teeth. Black talons reaching out. And these kids begin screaming at the top of their lungs. Everything else was kind of this frozen moment. Watching their mother splash the water in her face. Watching her turn around. Even watching this reptilian appear in front of them. You're in shock. But as it's beginning to walk towards you. Talking about how much she just wants to devour you. These two boys begin screaming at the top of their lungs. And the creature's getting closer and closer to them. And it's talking about how much it just wants to take a bite. Just one bite to start with. Just a nibble. Suddenly... Just the loudest pounding on the front door. Someone is banging on the door as loud as they can. And they're saying, is everyone okay in there? What's going on? Is everyone okay? Because all they hear is two boys screaming bloody murder. Their bloody murder. The murder that's about to happen. And Sam says, we hear the banging on the door, me and my brother. And we turn. And we hear someone on the other side of the door saying, do you need any help? And instinctively, I mean, we realize now we've turned our view away from this threat. This not, I mean, this person's knocking on the door. This is a nine-foot reptilian wanting to eat us. He goes, we turned back. And there stood our mother in a daze. She just kind of seemed to wobble there for a second. She looked around the room like she had no idea what had just happened. And she fell to her knees and grabbed her children and held them tight. Are you okay? Are you okay? She says. And Sam and Charlie are still trying to process this. Like they just saw their mom become this creature that 30 seconds ago they thought would only exist in a sci-fi or horror movie. They saw it in their room. It was there. And he's panicked about this. Little Sam is panicked about this, but his mother is now holding him, saying, I promise I'll never do that again. I promise. And Sam thinks about that for a second, and he goes, wait. So is this real? Like, she didn't deny it. She didn't say that it was a trick of the light, like when I think there's a monster under my bed. She says she'll never do it again. What? And as he's trying to really wrap his head around this thing, she kind of nuzzles him. She puts her face against his neck. And he gets this guttural feeling. He hears in his work that he gets this, and he gets this guttural feeling. He thinks she's still a monster. She looks human, but she's still a monster. He's thinking that. And as he's thinking that, he hears his mother start to growl. 
her face pressed up against his neck. Like a loving mother would, but this still isn't her. Sam begins to panic, and his mom laughs and says, Promise, last time. Eventually, the mom gets up from hugging him, goes to the door, says, Oh, sorry, there was a rat in the room, and my boys don't like rats. That's what all the screaming was. I really, really apologize if I we woke you up. The next morning, they left the hotel room. They had planned on staying there a couple days, but nobody felt safe there. And for years, Sam and Charlie remembered this event. They talk about it with each other. Now, it's interesting that this story was just... A six-year-old seeing this with their parent. Would I have covered it? It still is a very interesting story, but the fact that we have two witnesses, three, really, if you count the mother, we'll get this wrapped up here in a second, but the fact that we have the two brothers who over time can share the story, and sure, that may lead to details becoming more sensationalized because people are misremembering it and they're spreading their misremembering, but you have the two boys, you have... It's really hard to do a trick of the light when you have two different people sitting at two different angles, but... So that was one reason why I wanted to talk about the story. It might be true. But let's go ahead and continue. He continues to talk to his brother about it for years. I don't know if it was a normal course of conversation. Hey, what'd you do today? Oh, I had a lot of fun. What about you? Oh, you know, I stayed at home. Remember when mom turned into a reptilian? I don't know how common it was, but he goes, for years we would talk about this. And also for years we would ask mom about it. We'd say, mom, remember when we were in that hotel and that creepy thing happened? And she would always say, I don't want to talk about it. I want to talk about it. And he still thought it was weird that she never denied it. Even that first night when she goes, I promise I'll never do that again. I promise. She didn't say, I don't know what you guys are screaming about. Like, I just walked out of the bathroom. She sensed something had happened. Even she knew something had happened. And she goes, I promise that'll never happen again. And that always kind of bugged Sam. Because it didn't mean that she had control over it. Like, what exactly happened? And he goes, for years, I tried getting more information from her and nothing would happen. He goes, and then, really, two different things have added another wrinkle to the story. One, he goes, my older brother has completely forgotten about the story. He goes, we talked about it for years after the fact. We both were there. We talked about it years after the fact. He goes, and then at one point I brought it up and my brother had no idea what I was talking about. Zero. He goes for almost 25 years, because he this gentleman is 43 now, for almost 25 years. <laughs> I don't know how often he brought this up. They're like waiting for a movie to start. They're at the theater, and he's like, hey, yeah, yeah, can I borrow some popcorn? Nom, nom, nom. Hey, remember when mom turned into reptile? He, the older brother did not remember the story. He goes, nowadays, my brother is starting to remember it. That's such a weird detail. But he also finally got a confession out of his mother. Years later, when Sam is around 17 years old, he finally is able to get the story out of his mom of what happened. And she said, I don't know. I remember being in the bathroom. And then I was in the dark. I was in a place of utter blackness. But I could sense you in the distance. I could sense my children somewhere in the void. And I was walking towards you to protect you. I, I couldn't find you. And I knew I needed to get to you. Something else was in my body. And I was gone. And then the next thing I know, I was standing over you too. And you were sobbing. She then ends the story by saying, but I never did it again. Did I? Even she questions exactly how much control she has over her body, over her fate. This creature possessed her and tried to eat her children. She doesn't know. This is the thing about possession, right? You have such little control over your life. She doesn't even know if it happened again. She has to ask, I didn't do that again, did I? 
Did the creature ever leave her? Is it still in her now? Was she possessed or was she always some sort of reptilian shapeshifter? The, the story is, is, is so bizarre because you think it's a standard haunting and then a creature that is most typically seen in the sci-fi community of paranormal, UFOs, aliens, world-conquering species of outsiders, popping up in a cheap hotel. I love this story. It's a great Halloween. It's a great Halloween story for us, for the kids who went through this. It's absolutely terrifying. But imagine that horror in that hotel room, and then even imagine after that. Like, how would you have a relationship with your mom if you thought at any point she could turn into a nine foot tall lizard man? And she wanted to eat them, and then she continued to play the game afterwards. Ah, oh, just kidding horrifying story a woman shape-shifting into a nine foot tall reptilian creature you'd have to wonder every moment after that if your mom ever truly came back or if the person who lived in your house and took care of you and fed you and raised you wasn't some sort of monster And you would just be thinking, why is this Why is this person making me peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? It's not my real mom. It's this thing. How would you ever get over that? I think I would spend the rest of my childhood, I think I would spend the rest of my adulthood constantly wondering if my mom was really my mom. If my mom ever came out of that darkness and is still wandering that void looking for her children. And this woman standing in front of me is just an imposter. And then you would wonder what the end goal was. Why is this reptilian taking the form of my mom? These type of thoughts could drive you crazy, honestly. And if you said them out loud, they may lock you up. If you thought your real mom disappeared in a hotel and this was some sort of reptilian shapeshifter. So over time, you start to tell yourself, ah, oh, this is my real mom. It was just a one-off event. But in fact, your mom is still lost. Wanting to hold you. Wanting to hug you and kiss you and say you're safe. But she can't. Her soul is locked behind the psychic walls of a reptilian mind prison. The mother you love is not the mother you have. The mother you have may be a monster simply wearing her skin. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. TikTok is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.